All right, so you'll see that we do continue to drop in um, a document that has all of the session links that we're gonna be using. And again, for those of you who weren't here when I mentioned it, um, go ahead and pull up that document if you'd like. Um, it has all the links and we'll also be helping you along the way by dropping in links just in time as we go as we're referencing the different links. So um, I think we'll go ahead and officially launch um, and get started. We're so glad uh, to have you join us for the next hour. We're really pleased to be hearing from our team about their work on obtaining uh, high response rates through collaborative survey practices. Um, what we're going to be doing today is that we'll start today hearing about our partnership uh, between RHEL Northwest and the Alaska Department of Education and Early Development, otherwise known as DEED. So we'll probably be using shorthand for Alaska DEED, state agency in Alaska. Um, we're going to hear about the partnership. We're going to hear about their work around trauma-engaged practices and a framework that they've developed and a whole suite of tools. Then we're going to share some um, resources and lessons learned um, that we've obtained through uh, working with them on this project. And then we'll have this opportunity to go into breakout rooms to dig a little deeper. And that'll be a little um, uh, choose your own adventure, if you will, um, for the second half of this webinar. You'll be able to choose kind of the area that you want to learn more about or talk, engage in more discussion around. So now's the time for those of you logging on to get ready to hear about this amazing collaboration. Um, I don't wanna give out any spoilers, but I am going to say that the response rates for this survey are super high and we're so excited about what we've learned and how we can share that with you. So our goals today for our time together, um, like I said, are to share lessons learned from this REL Northwest uh, partnership um, with Alaska Deed on the Alaska Trauma Engaged Schools Partnership Survey Administration. We're going to share some resources for developing um, and supporting collaborative survey practices. And then we're going to provide you with that opportunity to connect with experts, with peers, and with each other um, to explore um, collaborative survey practices in more depth. Before we do that, before we get started um, hearing about the trauma-engaged work in particular, we wanted to tell you a little bit about the Institute of Education Sciences who sponsors this work um, and a little bit about the REL program in particular. So IES um, is the, an independent research arm of the U.S. Department of Education. It has four centers that comprise IES. Um, the National Center for Education Evaluation and Regional Assistance, NCEE, is where the Regional Education Laboratory Program is housed, along with the What Works Clearinghouse and other types of, of projects and initiatives that are meant to really kind of bridge research and practice and policymaking. So um, the REL program is, has actually been around for almost 60 years. Um, the most recent authorization was in the Education Sciences Reform Act or ESRA in two, uh, 2002. But again, the program has been along for a really uh, long time, almost 60 years. There are 10 regional education laboratories across the country, including REL Northwest. You see us in that Kelly green color. So we serve the states of Montana, Idaho, Oregon, Washington, and Alaska. Um, the RELs collaborate with districts, state education agencies, and other education partners to generate and apply evidence with the goal of improving learner outcomes. So everything that we do is about bringing evidence to bear to help affect change at the local level and state level. So look, that's about um, IES and the REL. And now what we're going to do is we're so excited to kick off our um, REL Alaska Trauma Engaged School Partnership with three speakers to get us going. Um, so the first speaker that we have is Sharon Fischel um, from Alaska Deed, and Sharon's going to set the scene for us and tell us a little bit about the framework for trauma engaged practices. Over to you, Sharon. Welcome, everybody. I'm Sharon Fischel from the Alaska Department of Education. I've been with the Department of Education for 20 years now in, in education for about 35. And so what I'm going to talk to you today is about a really exciting project that we started about six, seven years ago. Um, the Transforming Schools, a framework for trauma-engaged practice in Alaska, was created for Alaskans by Alaskans as a guidance guideline for our schools. 
Alaska's trauma work first started with our Alaska Mental Health Board and the Division of Behavioral Health in partnership with our Alaska Child Trauma Center. In schools, the work was first started with our Alaskan Alternative Schools Coalition in 2008. In 2013 through 15, through the Behavior Risk Factor Surveillance Survey, we surveyed Alaskan adults um, on their ACEs, and we've done a lot of work with that uh, moving forward. As a result of the growing awareness and those entities noted above, DEED and the Association of Alaska School Boards were regularly being contacted by school districts, seeking support to become trauma-informed, and then a deeper conversation began. The Alaska Mental Health Board, the Department of Ed, and the Association of Alaska School Boards then brought together a group of stakeholders to start talking about how we could better meet the needs of our districts and schools. It was found that many of our schools were recreating the wheel or spending a lot of money on something that didn't quite meet their need and it didn't quite fit. Alaska's unique geography, culture, and history are essential components to consider in supporting students, families, and communities and our school staff. We found that it wasn't enough just to be informed or sensitive to trauma. Educators needed to be engaged with the trauma and actively practicing trauma-engaged strategies. A core group began meeting in May of 2017, which ultimately led to the creation of the Transforming Schools, a framework for trauma-engaged practice in Alaska, which you can see the lovely picture um, on the slide. The final document was then released January of 2019. To date, over 13,000 copies of this framework have been distributed across our state and nationwide. The final document was created by hundreds of Alaskans. Even the artwork is from an Alaskan artist. There are 11 chapters, everything from deconstructing trauma, where we pulled some of the data from our previous Burfus collections on ACEs for Alaskan adults, to skill instruction, to policies. We also have some chapters that you don't necessarily find in other documents that talk about trauma in schools. That is family partnerships, cultural integration, and community co-creation. With Alaska's history of generational trauma, it was critical that these were included in our framework. Each chapter has a quote from an Alaskan, a case study which shows a common practice versus a transformative practice with an ideal outcome, key research findings, suggested steps, and reflection questions. It was clear that having the framework was just the beginning of supporting our schools. The Association of Alaska School Boards indeed then started taking, talking about the next steps. An online toolkit, which was released in August of 2020. This web-based resource dovetailed with the framework, but offered practical steps and resources for leadership and staff. And for some chapters, it also had suggested steps for families and school boards or even students. Videos of trainings on all 11 chapters of the framework were created and added to the toolkit. There's social media templates that were created for schools, as well as short videos by Alaskans emphasizing key topics for each chapter that were developed. The most recent addition to the toolkit resource, resources released in 2020 are milestone guides for each chapter that in effect offer a work plan to become a trauma-engaged district or school. The next step in our process, we will be working with AASB on a coaching model in some of our school districts. DEED also has a suite of online professional development e-learning modules focused on trauma in our state system. The original module, Overcoming ACEs in Alaska School, has led to a total of 12 trauma courses available without charge to Alaskan educators. We have over 3,000 users in our e-learning system with 3,300 school staff members having taken at least one trauma course. The average number of trauma courses taken is more than three each. The framework has been cited by many different government agencies as a promising approach to the, to the work of schools. It has become used by districts outside of Alaska to develop their own responses to, to trauma. However, it became clear that while it was being used in various districts, the department and AASB did not know the extent of the uptake and the impact of the resources. So in the fall of 2020, we were contacted by RHEL Northwest to be a partner in their grant application. After they were awarded the grant, our work then began with the development and deployment of the implementation survey. And Ashley is gonna tell you all about that. 
Thank you, Sharon. I'm first going to pass it now actually to Shannon McCullough, our colleague from REL Northwest, who's going to share more about the actual creation of the survey tool that Sharon just mentioned. Take it away, Shannon. Thank you, Danette. Um, so a big focus for us throughout each step of developing and administering the survey was that we wanted to be sure that we were reflecting the Alaska's transforming schools framework itself that Sharon was just talking about. And so because of that, we were really intentional about trying to embed things like co-creation, collaboration, reflection, and flexibility throughout the entire process. And because I think our process was a little bit different than most, um, I wanna walk you through our steps, starting with how we identified Alaska's needs after Deed brought together some key players. And then we'll talk a little bit about how we collaborated to develop and refine the survey. So first, AKD convened a group of stakeholders that played a role in developing or in implementing the trauma-engaged framework, and were also interested in contributing to the development of the survey. And that group included representatives from across Alaska, including the Association of Alaska School Boards, the Alaska Department of Health, the Alaska Mental Health Trust Authority, the Center for Human Development at the University of Alaska Anchorage, and as well as um, individual school districts. So before jumping directly into the survey, we wanted to spend the first of our four of our five working sessions really getting to know each other, um, establishing expectations for the team, and really digging into the goals for the survey. Um, we wanted to be able to say that we had a solid understanding of the framework itself. Um, and we also wanted to understand the way that the team hoped to use the results of the survey. Um, and that really helped guide the development of the survey. Um, we feel like this step was particularly important for us um, as it aligned with some of the key values of the trauma-engaged framework. The survey was not meant to be something that was developed for the state of Alaska, but we wanted it to be something that was co-created with individuals representing the unique needs of the students and the communities in Alaska. So we set aside the next three working group sessions to begin to iteratively develop the survey. Um, we started by asking the working group members to complete a short little survey for us to help us kind of prioritize the topics they wanted to see on the final version of the survey. We then compiled all of those responses and spent some time during one of our meetings talking through the results. We tried to make sure that we had a really strong understanding of the team's perspective um, and the aspects of the framework's implementation that they were most interested in understanding. We then spoke with the group about the unique story that they wanted to tell with the survey's results and how different types of survey questions or response items can contribute to that story. So for example, we discussed whether it would make more sense to talk about implementation as a percentage of school staff agreeing or disagreeing that their school regularly uses a practice, or if it might be more helpful to describe how frequently staff use a particular practice. The team decided that a survey with Likert type responses ranging from strongly disagree to strongly agree would provide them with the best way to talk about implementation in the, st in the state. And so from there, we spent some time discussing who would be the best person or people from each school to complete the survey. Um, we found out pretty quickly that this, the size of schools and the composition of schools throughout Alaska really vary. So we decided that maybe there wasn't going to be a single person or a distinct role across all the schools. So instead, we asked each school to convene a small group of staff that was most knowledgeable about the school's trauma-engaged practices, and we asked them to complete the survey together. Um, so REL Northwest then developed some sample questions and response options based on these discussions we've been having. And over the next two sessions, we really gathered and incorporated feedback from the team. Uh, first, we asked an expert in trauma-engaged and resiliency-based practices to review the survey and provide some feedback for us. Um, we also asked several school employees to pilot the survey um, for their feedback, as well as an estimate of the amount of time it might take to complete the survey. Um, the finalized survey was pretty lengthy, um, approximately an hour to complete as a team, um, but we feel that it really captured all of the aspects of the framework that the team hoped to understand. 
And so by not rushing through this process, we were able to make sure that the survey was developed collaboratively and included input from multiple diverse perspectives. Um, and we think that's a great way of reflecting the framework itself. Thank you, Shannon, um, for walking us through the co-creation of the survey tool. Um, next, we're gonna hear from Ashley Bull, another colleague of ours from RHEL Northwest, who's gonna lead us through the survey administration component of the project and get um, to the big reveal on response rates. Thanks, Jeanette. So as many of you probably already know, having a strong survey tool is important, but a strong tool in and of itself isn't enough to make sure you get the information you need from a survey. Like Sharon and Shannon mentioned, AKD and their partners hope to learn about implementation of trauma-engaged practices and policies in public schools across the entire state. The working group felt strongly that in most cases, a single individual wouldn't be able to speak to all of the practices and policies at their school. Instead, they felt that the survey should be completed by a group of individuals that could offer different perspectives about their school. They also agreed that the group would need sufficient time to discuss and collaborate to complete the survey. And that landed us at thinking it would take about an hour to do this, um, along with the feedback from the pilot. We knew this was gonna be a big ask to invite every public school in the state to compile a team and set aside an entire hour for the survey. Given how much we were asking of schools, we also knew that we were gonna to need to be really strategic about how we engaged in the survey administration process. So to help facilitate a successful process, RHEL Northwest and the working group developed a comprehensive but flexible survey administration plan. The administration plan included a detailed roadmap of the survey process. Some of the key components included in this were a summary of responsibilities that outlined what each person involved was expected to do, an outreach timeline that indicated when, who, and how each piece of communication would be distributed, draft outreach materials, that were ready to be sent as is or adapted as needed, and step-by-step -step guidance to walk through key processes like how to check response rates in SurveyMonkey. In designing this plan, a great deal of thought was put into who should send different types of messaging about the survey and the target audience for different survey communications. As an example, AKD's acting commissioner sent out the initial information about the survey to district superintendents with leaders from the Association of Alaska School Boards and the Alaska Council of School Administrators CC'd on the email to emphasize their shared endorsement of the survey and get district buy-in. We also spent a really decent chunk of time curating an up-to-date list of school leader and counselor contact information, which was really crucial for ensuring the survey got into the right hands of each school. Outreach efforts to get the word out about the survey included emails, newsletters, announcements at conferences, and some personalized outreach. These communications came from multiple individuals with Indeed, as well as multiple agencies, associations, and organizations in the state that work with schools. So schools were really hearing about this survey from many different voices. Another key part of the administration plan was a weekly review of response rates. This was key to the survey's success as it allowed the team to quickly identify and find alternatives to problematic emails, look for patterns if there were districts or areas that had lower response rates, and flag schools that may benefit from a little bit of personalized outreach to encourage participation. This weekly process of reviewing response rates not only kept the team informed about progress, but also led to some important deviations from the survey administration plan. One major change was the addition of incentives for schools that responded to the survey. Incentives were not originally part of the plan because AKD wasn't able to offer incentives. So as we checked response rates and kind of came to the conclusion that they might be really helpful, it required coordination across agencies to secure that funding. 
To put incentives in place, the Association of Alaska School Boards applied for and was awarded funding from the Alaska Mental Health Trust Authority. And after receiving the funds, the Association of Alaska School Boards collaborated with AKD to make sure all of the participating schools actually got the incentive that they should get. This shift not only highlights ideal practice in terms of using incentives to encourage survey participation, but also emphasizes how the collaborative nature of the framework translated to the survey administration process itself. No single organization or agency was doing this alone. Changes we made to the survey administration plan based on our review of response rates included changing how the survey links could be accessed and decisions about when to identify alternative points of contact for different schools. Together, the development of a clear and well-articulated plan that ensured everyone involved had a good understanding of both processes and roles, coupled with some built-in flexibility to change course as needed, resulted in a response rate of nearly 60% of public schools across the state. And I want to pause here and let that sink in because this wasn't a quick survey that people could do in a few minutes and kind of check off the list. This was a 60% response rate for a collaborative hour-long survey of public schools across Alaska, which we really do think is something to celebrate. Terrific. Thank you, Sharon, Shannon, and Ashley for starting off this conversation. There's so much to learn from this process. We put it together in one resource, um, and you can find a link to that resource in the chat. All right, so I'm encouraging everybody to really open up this resource, download it. It is full, full, full of the story with many, many more details and questions to think about your context. And we are now also at a point in this learning experience where we're going to pause and make a little transition of shifting from listening to these, the story to start to think about your own context. So I'm gonna ask you to just take a moment and think about why you joined this webinar and what you are most curious about when you think about collaborative survey practices and what you would most like to learn more about. The second half of this time, you will have choice for how you participate in this webinar. One option is going to be more time with these presenters. So you can choose to go into a kind of Q&A breakout room with either Sharon, Ashley, um, or Shannon to kind of dig in a little bit more, or you can choose to take some time to dig into this resource with a group of peers in a more of a discussion group context. So again, you have the Q&A with the presenter option or discussion group. And if you're like, I wanna go with every single presenter, don't worry, we will send out the recordings of those breakout rooms afterwards. And we're gonna do this through a poll. So in a moment, you will see, let me just change the slide to match this part here, your breakout room choices. And you're gonna see a poll pop up as there it is now. And I'm going to ask you to select where you would like to go next. I see the rooms are filling up. Where is it going? Okay. If you have already made that choice, we're going to help you kind of get ready for this to make sure that your questions get answered as well. Um, if you selected one of the Q&A groups, you will also see, we're going to throw into chat a place to start writing down your questions. There. And those are going into the chat right now. We have about 70% response rate. So encourage you to select, make your choice of where you would like to go. Open up that Q&A document.
start getting those parts in here. And again, we'll have a facilitator in each room with your presenter. So you can start kind of capturing your questions of which room you are interested in hearing more about. I think we're gonna, we'll go ahead, give you a few more seconds to make that. That selection, we have almost all of everybody participated in participating now. Oh, great, it's in the chat part here. And you can see as you're finding which group you're in, you will get the group you selected. So no, um, no worries about that part. And I think, we can, let's close that poll and start getting ourselves ready. We're gonna give us another minute here. So again, I encourage you to click open those links, start getting your questions down that you wanna make sure get to your presenter. If you are in a comfortable space to, this is gonna be the time where we're gonna invite you to turn on your camera and have a little bit more of a connected experience with, um, with your different presenters. Awesome, see some cameras coming on, getting ready to talk. We'll have multiple ways to participate in that room through both the question answer and the document there, and as well as chat here. Thank you, it's kind of fun to see the black boxes turn into real human beings in different contexts behind each of those, those ones. We're just getting all the rooms set. Uh, thank you guys all for turning on your camera. It's so nice to see all these different faces here. Again, I encourage you to take this moment in this transition time to both check out the guide that we have created and start getting your questions in. All right. So you have joined the breakout group to, to chat more with Sharon about the actual trauma engaged framework, how that came about, what the project's all about, the foundation, et cetera. So um, she's going to be the responder and I'm going to try to field some of the questions. So um, Sharon, is there, to get us going, is there anything that you wish you would have had the time to say in that kind of short introduction or preview that you'd like to lift up? Um, now to get us going before we dive into very specific questions. You know, I think the one of the big things is that this is not um, Depart Alaska Department of Ed's book. It's everybody's book. Um, the breadth of stakeholders and the many times that we took this out to people to get feedback is numerous. You know, there, you know, we went to Every conference we could, every meeting that we could, we presented what we were doing, you know, starting from what should the chapters of this framework be? Um, it, it's, it's very much a uh, Alaskan product. It's not um, the Department of Eds. It's not the Association of Alaska School Boards. And, you know, it was a very, you know, it was a very long and collaborative process to actually write the document and. You know, we have a team with the Department of Ed and AASB that meets every week to talk about next steps and what we're doing. You know, I, I had a, a stack of drafts, you know, at least two feet deep at one point when I was still working in the office of how many iterations we went through to get to where we landed. Um, and, you know, it's a beautiful document just to look at, let alone, you know, read it. It's, it's very much Alaskan artwork, very much representative of our rural communities and our villages. Um, so it's, um, it, was, it was a very labor intensive, but beautiful product in the end. And, you know, we're still working on what, what do we need to do next? And, you know, moving through um, trying to develop a coaching model to be able to use to help districts and schools with the implementation and that kind of thing. So I'll, what kind of questions do you have? 
Okay, well, our first question for you, Sharon, is this. Um, one of our participants is interested in what kinds of traumas um, you focused on and what's the evidence base for the framework? So we didn't part, we didn't focus on any particular trauma as you would um, say, you know, it wasn't, you know, your national survey, you know, the, the, the ACEs, the original ACEs questions, we took a more comprehensive approach of looking at it as adverse childhood experiences, adverse environmental experiences. And then all the time we have to have a back, uh, the, right back here, the intergenerational and generational trauma that our Alaska Native population has experienced um, through education and and life in general. And so it's a real kind of, you know, I found myself going out to, you know, when I'm going out to national conferences and going to different uh, presentations on trauma and those types of things, but none of them talked about, none of the presentations I've ever went to national ever talked about community co-creation or cultural responsiveness or uh, family partnerships. And those were critical components. And through COVID, the what became one of our more con critical components was the self care chapter of this framework, um, because you know everybody struggled through COVID and and you know that there none of our chapters are in any particular order. Um, if you turn into the to the first page, second page, you'll see it's all in a circle um, because. People, districts need to go to whatever chapter they feel they need to work on. And some of them might have deconstructing trauma down. They know what ACEs is and are. And um, the evidence base for the framework, now this has been um, reviewed and promoted by the American Institute for Research as a promising practice. We were one of five international projects that were listed um, in a document, and I'll find the link and drop that in the chat if you'd like to read that. Um, the Chicago School District um, based uh, their healing-centered framework off of our framework, and we found out about that because somebody contacted us to be part of another research project. And so um, it's not evidence-based yet, but I think through all the work we're going to do with RHEL, we just might get there. <laughs> yeah. One of our initial steps in that regard is we're going to be working with um, a group of schools to help them really kind of test some of these strategies in short cycle kind of experiments. And, um, and part of what that effort will be creating some evidence briefs. So really mm -hmm. gathering up what are the evidence levels related to each of the practices that are in the framework itself. You and mentioned everything, COVID. everything in, in it is research-based. It's list, you know, there's different research entities that are listed for each of the chapters that we've decided on. Right. Yeah, I was going to point that out that you have like a key research findings for each chapter, right? Where you summarize like the research around that particular yeah. topic or area, whether it's, as you said, the self care or one of the other mm -hmm. um, practices. So, yeah, that, that's great. Sure. It's a good resource. You mentioned COVID, Sharon, and one of the questions was about um, how or if the framework um, has incorporated lessons learned from the pandemic. Um, and if not, how you um, plan to incorporate those lessons. So if you want to just expand on that a little bit, that'd be great. Um, well, the framework was released prior to COVID, about a year before COVID really came about. And, you know, our toolkit, our online toolkit was developed during COVID. So we ever all of us, um, the Association of Alaska School Boards and Department of Health and the Department of Ed, you know, all had, you know, I'm on the health and safety team. So um, our team responds to, there's four of us that respond to everything that is health and safety in the state. And so COVID was, was a mighty task, but um, we did many presentations that kind of focused around the framework and how the framework was available. Um, I think Pat Sidmore and myself presented over a hundred times about grief and tra traumatic events, which, you know, the 
the pandemic was a traumatic event for all of us. And how do we respond to that? And how do we move through the stages of grief and those different things? And we pulled a lot of the resources off of, out of the framework and off of our online toolkit, as well as, um, you know, we have our e-learning uh, program, which Sam, who is in here, um, is the manager of all of that, um, that, you know, we have 12 courses now. And one of the courses that we were in the process of developing when COVID hit was our self-care self e-learning module. And we ramped up that production really fast. And we released that probably three, four months before we had planned on releasing it. And the use of that was just insurmountable. There were so many educators that, um, A, took a lot, you know, they weren't in the class and our, our usage of our trauma courses during the pandemic um, was a lot um, that educators were going back in and doing those types of things. Great, thanks for that. There's a couple of questions that really focus on implementation. So folks are really curious what um, some specific examples of what implementation um, looks like in schools or at the district level. Hmm. You know, that's a good question. And that's why we did this survey. But um, I, I can say that uh, we have um, 13 alternative schools that are part of a coalition in our state. And our alternative school model is different than most of the lower 48, where it is not discipline based. Kids and students choose to go to these schools. Um, most of the kids that, it, you know, the, the, it's for kids that the traditional program and traditional school doesn't work. And so our alternative schools are have actually it being trauma engaged and practicing is the nature of their business every day. Because, you know, they have kids that are at risk. They have kids that are pregnant, parenting. Um, some may have gotten into some discipline problems, but in in the most, it, it's not that type of, of school. And so they're struggling with mental health issues, addiction issues, and those types of things. And so the way they do business is different than a traditional school. And actually the way they do business is they're, they're all trauma engaged in practicing and how they approach learning and how they approach their students. Um, we, the Association of Alaska School Boards just got a research grant on the trauma-engaged practice also that they're focusing on the coaching aspect of that. And Mickey, who's on the screen here, is going to be one of those coaches with them from the department and figuring out what is the best way to implement? How do we coach schools through the process? Um, and, you know, we're just at the beginning of that right now. And you know, once we have all the survey data, you know, we're gonna be so rich in data as to what schools are actually doing. Um, I, it, it'll be just, it's gonna be great. Nice. I wanna encourage you all to enter additional questions either in the chat or the document, or even because we're a pretty small group, you can pop on, just take yourself off of mute and jump in and ask your questions. Um, that would be great too. It, while we wait for folks to do that, I'm curious, Sharon, um, when you think about five or 10 years from now and the, kind of the arc of this work um, that has been really incredibly time intensive and um, important work, I'm curious what you see in terms of if everything were to, you know, if the stars were to align, what what's happening in the state of Alaska as a result of this work five or 10 years from now? You know, I would... I would love to see that our students are successful and our teacher, our educators are successful. You know, it's a really hard time in education right now for teachers. And um, most of our teaching population comes from the lower 48, We're, that we don't have enough that we grow in growing our own. And so having a document like this that can educate educators coming into our state and, you know, it just, we need to make schools a safe and friendly place for students and families and for educators to have the knowledge to be able to do that. Uh, you know, we say a lot on our team, had I known when I started in education what I know now, boy, I would have done things a little differently. 
And I think a lot of us that are that are in this call would agree with that statement. It's just there's so much that's happening to kids and families. You know, we have the highest suicide rates in the nation. We have the highest domestic ass assault rates in the nation. You know, the list goes on, unfortunately. And so, you know, trauma is a big deal in our state. And, you know, addressing it is also a big deal. So my hope is that there would be more awareness in practicing of, you know, not, not re-traumatizing kids in, in classrooms. Right here. Um, we have another question that has dropped in. So did you work with other SCAs at all during the development of the framework and or have you had other SEAs approach you for, for advice and guidance on how to develop a similar framework in their state? We did not work with other state education agencies. Um, we worked with a lot of agencies within our state to develop something that was um, conducive to Alaska and Alaska educators. Um, you know, lots of times we are we are, you know, given stuff from the outside that just really doesn't fit um, our schools. You know, we have a school district that has 15 kids and a school district that has 50,000 kids. Um, and that's our range. School district, not school, school district that has 15 kids. So um, we have had a couple of states approach us about our framework um, and ask if they can, you know, use it and use concepts from it and um yeah we 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 definitely will share what we have and what we've learned with others um but it, you have to you have for it to be able to work in your state you have to develop it within your state it's not something that any state could potentially just pull off and say this is us because it's purely alaskan but the concepts everybody can use Terrific. We have another question that's come in. Um, is there anything in the framework um, for trauma of educators? Mm, that's a good question. Um, no, you know, we have the self-care chapter, but that's about it. Um, you know, it's a good thought. We've talked a lot in a lot of the work that we've done as a department and with the Association of Alaska School Boards over COVID is to really kind of shift and, and let our team at least shift our focus from students to educators because the students aren't going to lean learn if the educators aren't ready to teach and um you know we have we have examples of new teachers showing up to some of our alaskan villages and not even getting off the plane because they see where they're going to um so it's really important for people coming into our state to really have a, a clear understanding of where where they're going and um what they're doing so great thanks for that sharon i'm i'm curious about one of the things that strikes me as really um special <laughs> about this work is your collaboration among so many state agencies and i'm wondering if you could talk a little unpack unpack that a little bit more for folks just to talk about kind of what you've learned from that, what it takes in order to kind of keep that coalition together, essentially to, to stay on track together with all the different demands and interests and all of that that you have to sort of negotiate in order to keep moving together. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? You bet. Um, there were nine writers of this framework. That's it. There were nine of us that put it together. And all of us, all most of us were from, you know, there or from a different agency. Um, we have a healthy schools collaboration that happens and has been going on for years where different agents, different departments and divisions um, across our system gather quarterly to talk about health related topics. And, you know, we kind of pulled somewhat from that, you know, I can't stress strong enough how much a partner the Association of Alaska School Boards has been in this process. We couldn't have done this without them. And so it, you know, there's there's a lot of give and take that happens. Uh, we had the first Alaskans Institute that was also part of this process um, because their voice was was needed. 
the Alaska Child Trauma Center. Josh Arvidson, who is an internationally known speaker on trauma, was one of the writers of, of this document and has participated and continues to participate. Um, so it, it just, you know, patience, practice, and just give and take would probably be my, my thing to say. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Nice to see you. Hello. To see people. You can feel free to turn on your cameras if you want. Uh, and I'm here with Shannon. You picked room two. That's great. Co-creating survey tools and convening groups. And everybody's doing a fabulous job of... Um, Shannon, I don't think we're going to have to worry about uh, uh, filling time with the number of questions. No, I think we're all set. <laughs> So uh, I'll introduce Shannon again. Shannon, do you want to, um, any quick intro you want to do or you want to dive into the questions or how do you want to um, proceed? Sure, I can do a super quick little intro. Um, I'm Shannon McCullough. I'm a research associate with WestEd, um, working as part of REL Northwest. Um, and I've been involved in the creation of this survey and now I'm the lead analyst um, working on analyzing the data that we've collected. Great. Uh, let's start with, uh, let's just dive into a couple of questions. Uh, maybe the basic, how did you decide what content to include in the survey? Sure. So um, I'm not sure if anyone has had a chance to look at the actual framework um, that Sharon talked about, but I will pop it into the chat. Um, basically, what we did is we took that framework is really incredibly developed um, and is broken it down into several different chapters. Um, and basically what we did is we took each of those chapters and we created a block of questions um, around each of those chapters in the framework. Um, we also added a block, block of questions focused on understanding how aware schools were of the framework itself and then how um, basically what the use of the framework is. Um, some of those questions were things like, you know, um, staff at the school are aware of Alaska's trauma-engaged suite of resources, including, and then it had a, a list of different types of resources that they might be aware of, and then the same type of questions for um, whether or not they use those, um, those resources. And then the last block of questions that we included was um, basically questions about facilitators and barriers. So we had a list of different, um, basically, things that could potentially facilitate or act as a barrier to implementation. So things like budgets, staff, school size, um, and then asked fo folks completing the survey to kind of rate how, how much of a facilitator or how much of a barrier those were. Um, but yeah, there's uh, trauma-engaged practices are a huge umbrella and there's tons of different things that we could have potentially put on the survey, um, but we really wanted this to be geared toward Alaska and its framework specifically. So we decided to use that framework as, as the base for the survey itself. I'm also gonna take the, the moment to uh, paste in the, the chat a, a blog that uh, is, completely on this project uh, that highlights the the, the highlights uh, the the specific uh, uh, parts of the project and lessons learned in there. So if you haven't seen that blog, um, that's a good resource uh, as well. Um, and uh, we'll and I can remind you about the survey, the session links document as well that has the uh, collaborative survey practices guide that's available that we think is a great tool. We'd love to hear uh, any feedback you have on that. Uh, let's go with, uh, I don't know what other questions you want to, if you want to take an order, but did you, did you have to consider any other data that was being collected when you were developing the survey is one question. Yeah. So, um, we knew that we know that Alaska already collects a fair amount of data on things like school climate and, um, student mental health. Um, and one of the big pieces of data that we are looking to, um, really compare this survey data to was their school climate and connectedness survey. And so the major thing that we we wanted to do was make our scales fairly or our response options fairly similar. Um, so the response options for this survey pretty well align with the response options for that survey. Um, we're also collecting, we also got a lot of um, administration administrative data from, um, from Alaska DEED. Um, so basically school level data on things from attendance to suspensions and um, 
as well as academic data. So we're in the process right now of digging through all of the data we got from this survey um, and looking at it in various ways along with that school climate and the administration data. Thanks. Uh, another question, given that the survey was taken collaboratively, were you concerned about which voices were heard in these contexts? Did you consider other setups and how did you decide this? Yeah, I think this was a pretty significant part of one of our meetings, or maybe a couple of our meetings, because we had to take some time to really think about it. Um, I think initially our first thought was, well, we'll send this to principals. Um, we didn't want it to be, especially post-COVID, a huge burden for the schools to have to, um, for, for example, for every staff to take. Um, and then after thinking about it, we didn't know if principals would be, have be able to have the best reflection of what was actually going on in their classrooms. Um, I think we then thought, well, maybe school counselors or psychologists, um, and we quickly learned that that was not the case in all of the schools in Alaska. Um, a lot of schools didn't have dedicated school counselors or school psychologists. And so given the size, especially the size was probably the challenge for a lot of these schools is that some of the schools only have staff of five people or fewer. Um, and so we didn't want to pick a single person that was going to be required to take this. Um, we thought that this kind of collaborative small group um, might be able to, by, by allowing the school to pick who was going to respond, um, that we might be able to get kind of the best responses. Um, we did collect data on who responded. Um, so we collected data on um, their role and then how long they'd been employed by the school for each person who was part of the team. So we'll also be kind of looking into that. Great, thanks. And if uh, if uh, there's a, quite a few questions in there, if you if you have a question that really that you really want <laughs> to be highlighted, go ahead and highlight your question, and I can. Get um, to I it, can but, just work my way down. Um, I, can, I see. Yeah, there's a good question <laughs> about participation rates. So participation rates are often low for surveys, even brief surveys. Do you feel the incentives were the key to getting higher participation rates? I think they were part of it, but I feel like we had pretty high participation, rate, participation rates. Even the incentives didn't come until pretty far into our process, um, because like Ashley mentioned, we were trying to get the funding um, from an outside source to be able to provide those incentives. Um, and I, I don't want to put you on the spot, Angela, but if you want to hop in here, I feel Angela <laughs> works with me on this project as well. Um, and she was doing a lot of the behind the scenes work on that. So I don't know if you have any insight into that, Angela. Yeah, I do. Um, I think what really helped with the part, uh, participation and response rate was that AKD had already had a really strong network across the um, state. And because of their personal connections, they were able to leverage and really increase district buy-in. Um, I also think the length of administration helped um, and the weekly reminders. We used um, SurveyMonkey's in, um, embedded email reminder feature so that we pre-scheduled that and that was allowed us to send the reminders each week and then we also extended the window even further to increase the um, participation rate so I think the incentives did play a role but I think it was really that the district had relationships and connections um, that encouraged mm -hmm. folks to respond uh, and and uh Continuing the incentives uh, conversation, there is a question about what were the incentives provided? Was it a conflict of was conflict of interest something to consider, and how could this be arranged through state reg regulations against gift giving? Yeah, so um, that was part of what Ashley was talking about. Is that AKD could not provide the funding directly to the schools because of that conflict of interest. Um, so what we ended up doing is getting funding from an outside source, and they directly gave the um, incentives to the schools. I cannot remember off the top of my head um, what the exact amount of money was, um, but someone, whoever wrote that question, if you want to pop in the chat, leave your email or anything, I can find that out for you, what the exact number was, or you might even be able to pop into Ashley's room <laughs> and she can tell you. Let's talk about uh, survey design. So there's a question at the bottom. How do you ensure that you got the responses uh, well, let me got to move our little lady turn. out of the way. <laughs> how do you, yeah. How do you ensure that the, you get the responses that you're wanting in your survey design? Like, 
does the survey question give you information or does it bring up questions about how it was interpreted and possibly change what you can take from the answer? Yeah, I think that that's a great question. Um, I think now that we have the results, we're, we're still asking ourselves some of those things. Um, I think that through a lot of talking with AK Deed and the folks that were involved with creating this framework, um, we really relied on them to tell us what they were looking for and what they were hoping to get out of the survey. Um, but we all know that people read questions different and interpret questions different. So we can take our best guess um, that we're getting the data that we're hoping for. Um, but yeah, I think I think we purposefully designed the survey to really align with the framework as much as possible. Um, and we're hoping, um, I saw one of the questions up at the top asking about um, how it was tested and collecting psychometric data. Um, this is really the pilot. This is the first time we're trying it out. Um, so we did do some um, some looking at the those different blocks of questions. Like I said, there's chapters in the, um, in the framework and we turned those basically into scales on the question um, and the scales have very high reliability and they're looking great so we're hoping that you know that that will go that our psychometric <laughs> data will look pretty good at the end too. Uh, question just typed in do you think Alaska has a unique advantage in terms of personal relationship building and using that to get buy-in? Yeah I think that you know the state is small I mean it's a big state with a smaller number of people um, and a smaller number of schools and districts and I think um, sometimes we would send an email to Sharon asking you know if she knows something about the school and she would respond back with five different first names and she is in very close contact with all the people we're talking about so I do think that's an advantage um, I could see that this would be much more difficult in a state that's more highly populated um, but I think that you can probably find people that are in similar roles to Sharon in a lot of states and in a lot of places. We have uh, some more questions, but uh, if, um, if anybody wants to uh, take themselves off mute and ask a yeah, quick happy question, <laughs> we would certainly love to this to be more interactive. Uh, we intended to just to just to answer questions here, but we certainly we have eight minutes left. So, does anybody have any specific questions they'd like to ask? Maybe raise raise your hand or just take yourself off mute and ask. Otherwise we'll, Anna, Anna, raise your hand. So Anna, yeah. you go first. There you go. Okay. Um, so I'm curious to know, cause I'll run into those uh, problems as well, where you can't utilize funding for incentives. Um, can you speak to the workaround in regards to you invited an organization in and gave them the funding? So then you could have incentives. Actually, they provided the funding. So oh, it was an outside organization. And it was basically like we asked that or applied for funding through them. Or oh. AKD did. And then they provided the funding instead of it coming from the state. Okay. All yeah. right. I thought I, that was very clever. <laughs> it was, yeah, like, yeah it worked yeah. out. <laughs> very clever. Okay. Thank you. I won't mm -hmm. hold the space. That's no. right. Anna, where are you from? Uh, where are you from? Just curious. Uh, from Virginia. Nice. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks for coming all the way to the Northwest. For, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Hope the travel was okay. Uh, anybody else uh, have a question they'd like to have answered verbally rather than written down? Is this a shy group or should I just continue to read <laughs> questions? I have one. There you go. Um, Leah. Hey, from Oregon, uh, Department of Education. And um, one of the... Uh, one of the things that we're really working toward is making sure that we're giving back to our survey respondents so that um, it's not in addition to any incentives that you might be able to muster up and be able to provide, um, giving them back the data in a way that's digestible and, and usable. Is there any like, uh, are you are you planning on that? And um, is there any difference to your survey questions um, that you made in order to be able to provide that information back in a digestible format. Oh, I wish I had this pulled up so I could easily share it with you. But Angela did some amazing uh, mail merging for us, and we did provide the data back to the schools. Um, we actually did them at 
the district handle is at the district level, and then it lists all the schools um, in the district and all the different questions. It gives them the percentages of um, schools in their district that responded at each item, um, and then an overall mean for each of the scales. Um, I think they turned out beautiful, and <laughs> uh, I think that it was, like you said, it's really helpful to be able to give that back um, so that they're able to kind of dig into that data with, with their staff. Can I ask a follow up? Sure. Yeah, and I was going to uh, say in the chat, I just put in if if anybody has any questions following up, I wish I would ask this or I'd like to contact uh, Shannon um, about this. There's there there's our email, Royal Northwest at uh, wested.org if you need any follow up. So go ahead, Leah. Yeah. Um, just thinking about so if the information then went to the district level, was there any concern about confidentiality or retaliation for how they answer the questions or any of that kind of thing, um, knowing that you were going to be providing that back to the district level mm -hmm. and it was collected at a school level? Yeah, I think that's definitely something to be concerned about because a lot of these districts do only have maybe one or two schools. Um, I think going into it, they knew that this wasn't necessarily going to be a private uh, survey, that we were going to have the data go back to the district and to the state. Um, so ideally, it would be great to be able to do this anonymously and <laughs> have uh, that be less of a concern. But I, yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. We still have a little over we have about three minutes left in this breakout room. Anybody else? If anyone right is, right I guess if you're interested, I can, sh I can show you what the survey looks like. Yeah, there you go. No, yeah, when it's not it's programmed, it's not going to, it was programmed into SurveyMonkey, um, but I can show you where it is if I can find it. Can y'all see it? We can. All right. So um, this is, as I was talking about, there's several different blocks of data. The first block is basically asking the folks completing the survey how aware they are of the different um, of the different resources that are part of the framework. We decided to link to them because we figured that it's possible someone knew about it but doesn't know the title or doesn't know necessarily it just by looking at the name. Um, like I said, the response um, choices are based on that school climate connectedness survey, which is why you have that disagree agree some kind of strange middle, <laughs> um, but we wanted to keep that aligned. Um, then the second block is looking at, instead of just awareness, looking at actual use of the resources. And then from there, we kind of go into the actual strategies. So each of these blocks is a chapter in the framework. Um, as I kind of mentioned in the webinar, we did a lot of kind of feedback processes with this. We went worked with um, with our team from Alaska, really deciding whether or not these things were important. How many we tried to keep the blocks of questions fairly small so that the survey wasn't super long, um, but everyone kind of has something that's most important to them, and it's kind of hard to kind of narrow certain things down. Um, so the first block is on school-wide planning and coordination. Um, we also have, let's see, a few blocks on policy, um, deconstruction, deconstructing trauma. So you can see that we have some that are a little shorter, a little bit about relationship building, school-wide practices, um, skill instruction, mostly focused on SEL. And uh, Shannon, you're currently kind of looking, you're looking at all the data right now and yeah, talk about that. Yeah. We have about a minute left, but quickly talk about what you're doing now. Yeah. So we're digging through all of the, you know, the 60% of schools that responded to us. Um, we're basically looking at, we're starting to kind of divide the schools into different implementation levels. So high implementation, emerging implementation, and kind of lower implementation. We're going to use those three levels to kind of see what do those what do the schools look like at those three levels. So we're curious, you know, is it all the bigger schools that have high implementation? Is it the schools that have the most money? Um, is it the 
do the schools that have high implementation also have high scores on the school climate connectedness survey? Um, so all those different things are kind of what we're, we're looking at right now and hope to have some data for in the next several months. And I think the, er, the only the early result, one of the early results we can share is that uh, uh, people were, districts, uh, schools were generally aware of the trauma-engaged framework, but the resources, so I think was a little lower. Is that correct? Yeah, I think they were, um, there was definitely more awareness than direct use. Um, so that's pretty interesting to see. Okay. Again, if uh, it's in the chat, I'll, uh, if you, uh, rel northwest at rel nw at wested.org, if your question didn't get asked, uh, please uh, e feel free to email us. Appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. I have placed the link to the document for group three. If you didn't get that link, it's in the chat. <clears throat> All right. So uh, we've got quite a list of questions getting populated. Uh, first question How long was the survey window open? Weekly check ins and opportunities to adjust methods seems very long. <laughs> yeah, it was a long window. Um, originally, so we had the pre-notification go out to district superintendents in early October, and our plan was to wrap up before the Thanksgiving holiday and Thanksgiving break. Um, we ended up through our uh, pivoting process as we were checking response rates and getting feedback from the field, learning that some folks wanted more time. They wanted to perhaps use that holiday time off, that would be a better time for them to reflect. Um, so we ended up extending it into December. So it was essentially a two month long window where people were able to engage with the survey. Great, I think, so the second question right after that, what was the timeline from survey announcement to completion? Yeah, so it went out, the first announcement to superintendents went out on October 5th. Um, the word got to schools on October 11th. So kind of the people that would actually be engaging with the survey on the ground, they those leaders found out on the 11th of October. Um, and then they had until mid-December to, to complete it. All right, can you tell us more about how AK Deed was able to collaborate and secure funding for schools to participate in the survey? What were some of the challenges and opportunities found during this process of finding funding resources? Yeah, so this was um, a group, a group that worked together to develop the survey and develop this plan is a group that has collaborated a lot in the past. There was a lot of history there. Um, many of them worked together to actually design and build the framework. So there was, um, just a lot of collaboration already kind of baked in when REL Northwest joined and, and began supporting this effort. So as we were talking about the survey, we knew in an ideal world that incentives were important, um, but just the reality of, of how AKD is structured and what they're able to do, that wasn't on the table for them to be able to actually provide those incentives. So as we were kind of getting ready to launch the survey, we were already kind of percolating about are, were there alternatives out there that could be pursued? Um, and we actually went a few routes before the route that ended up working out. We kind of talked about would there be ways that districts could provide incentives for their schools um, or would kind of a different organization providing that funding make most sense? And so they ended up having um, the Association of Alaska School Boards apply for the funding and be kind of the body that was responsible for giving out the incentives because Deed wasn't able to do that. And so that required a lot of collaboration to be able to um, have those relationships in place to facilitate kind of a seamless process for that, as well as the um, mental health trust authority being willing to provide that funding. Um, and I think they saw the importance of this for their school and were, were willing to do that. And I see a follow-up question in the chat, where did they apply for funding? Um, it was from one of their partners, the, the uh, Mental Health Trust Authority in Alaska. Um, did AKD set participation goals based on a prior survey experience? There were not participation goals. That 
that is not something we talked about. Um, I will say, I think we were all nervous <laughs> uh, about how people would respond to this survey. I know, you know, survey efforts are difficult. And I think in kind of smaller survey efforts, um, they weren't always successful in getting in getting high response rates. Um, so, you know, our goal was every school, uh, which we didn't meet that goal, but we tried to get as close to it as we could. Um, but I will say, I, I don't know that DEED has done something quite like this. So there wasn't something quite like this to compare it to. How would you adjust your administration plan, if at all, for larger or smaller states? That's a great question. So one thing I didn't get to talk about a ton um, in presenting, but I think is really important to emphasize, is that we weren't starting from a list of contacts that was just pulled from a state website as kind of the public school directory or something like that. The team at DEED and their partners, they spent a good chunk of time really looking at each school in their state and trying to sort out, you know, is this principal still there? Are they gonna be the right person to get this communication? Is there a school counselor we can CC to make sure they're aware and can kind of facilitate this happening? Um, and so that was really intentional and took a lot of time. Um, and then it took time, REL Northwest, what we did is we kind of helped them figure out like, here are the gaps you have. What can we, what resources publicly available can we use? Like, can we call some of these schools and figure out who the best person to send this to is? Um, and that's something that would be really hard in a big state and probably would have to transfer to kind of the district level at thinking about who in the district could maybe provide that type of contact information um, to make sure that list was really solid. Because I think without that list being such a good starting place, it would have been much more challenging. Uh, there's several questions about the incentives. Uh, what were the incentives provided to teams? It was a cash incentive for the school. Um, and I wish I knew the exact amount that it landed be, at being, there was a pot of money and it was essentially divided by the number of participants, but I wanna say it was between 100 and $200 per school. And so how did you determine what the incentive would be? Uh, the team, I think, felt pretty strongly that like schools can use cash <laughs> and that they can make choices for themselves about how, how to use um, the incentive. And so that really didn't even feel like much of a debate, honestly, that was kind of what it was gonna be. Uh, how much do you think the incentive made a difference in the response rate? So that is a really good question. And one that's really tricky to un like detangle because we announced the incentive around the same time as Deed started doing more personalized outreach. So those two things were kind of happening in a parallel time frame, but it made an immense difference. Um, I mean, the response rate jumped a lot based on those two factors kind of coming together. Um, and when I say personalized outreach, I mean, People at Deed picking up the phone and calling people that they knew in different contexts, calling people maybe they didn't but could reference someone that they knew and, and trying to make it a really a personal connection and something that they're talking to a real human, not just getting this survey monkey invite or these emails from, from different people. So those two things were kind of happening at the same time. So I can't, I wish, in, you know, in an ideal researchy world, that would have been staggered so that we could kind of figure out the impact of each of those strategies. But I can tell you together, they made a really big difference. Um, and was there only one survey that was answered by all of the members of one school? Yes. So that actually does um, get at one interesting nuance as well. So we wanted to make that very clear that it was one, one survey per school completed as a team. Um, and so the choice was made to use individualized survey links. So we use SurveyMonkey as the platform. Um, and essentially that meant that each uh, principal that got a survey had their own unique link that couldn't be you know, taken more than once. What we found out along the way was that when Deed and other folks were doing this personalized outreach and talking to people or, or sending them an email that was like more personal and direct, it was 
tricky to say like, go search through your emails and look for something from SurveyMonkey and then, you know, find that link and click it. So partway through the administration, we decided to open up a generic survey link where we gave it to, to Deed and let them kind of hand it out and dole it out to people. And um, that helped. We got some responses, a good number of responses that way, but it made it trickier to track the response rates. So we had to really carefully watch as responses were coming in and kind of make sure they were assigned to a specific school. Um, and we got a few duplicates, not a ton actually, I think because most of the administration was using the unique links. We did have a few duplicates. And so in those cases, we tried to reach back out to the schools to find out which we should use um, and kind of worked on a case-by-case -case basis about figuring out how to handle those. But the unique links helped a lot and made administration a little trickier. Uh, there was a mention for keeping an eye out for patterns and low response rates and addressing those. Could you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, so essentially what we did is we not only, we kind of made like a little template to help deed in this process, but we looked at response rates overall, but then we also looked by district. And the purpose of that was to figure out were there districts where maybe we needed to kind of engage someone at the district level to push schools um, and encourage them to complete it. And so that's just what we did every week when we looked at the overall response rate, we also looked by district and tried to flag if there was any that we wanted to get some district leadership to engage with. Um, and so we used that process. We also looked by locale because that was something um, that we wanted to make sure there was representation from kind of different parts of the state. Um, and that ended up not really, we did that, we checked them, but it didn't end up producing any like meaningful differences where we did different outreach uh, like the district rates did. You've talked a little bit about <clears throat> um, doing things within a larger state or something that's not statewide, looking at district level. What might have you done? What might you have done differently to try and get the high response rate without so many partners? That's a really good question. Um, I think one thing that really benefited this project was that there was just so much synergy around the trauma engaged framework and so many different people that really wanted to understand what this looked like in schools and how it was being kind of received and used. Um, and so I think it probably would be more difficult to be doing it solo. Um, but I think thinking about the, the different voices is still really important, even if they're not from different organizations, but having people that are in different roles kind of giving their endorsement and kind of validating that this survey is important and it's something that your district or your state may be able to learn from. Um, so I'm thinking about we had some folks at the district level that helped us build the survey and they were, you know, active voices in their own districts about why this is important and why for them, this is a priority. Um, and so voices like that, um, school counselors as well, that was another group that was engaged to kind of push school leaders to, to take this on, even though it was going to be a big lift. Um, so I think that would be my recommendation is even if it's not multiple partners, I think there is still value in getting people in different positionality and different roles to kind of get behind this effort and spread the word. So piggybacking off of that question and answer, um, beyond the incentives, uh, how are superintendents and school leaders motivated to complete the survey? Were there messaging around benefits and how they'd be able to use it? It's a really good question. Um, the framing around it generally was that this was not a compliance activity. This was not intended to kind of let the state know where your schools or your district falls in this continuum of, of implementation, but it was really to drive improvements for how the state provides these resources. And so, um, you know, that, that was the selling point. Uh, it was really that like, we're collecting this data so that we can better help you. Um, so, you know, Deed is planning to use this data to think about how their toolkit could be refined, to think about how the data could be used to coach individual schools and think about are there practices that they might want to work on, um, as well as to kind of fine tune some of the e-learning and things that they provide. So 
that was the marketing. And there really wasn't other than like lots of folks around the state encouraging that that really was the um the incentive i guess we did provide though district level reports uh to every district that was actually uh a request that we decided to to honor that to make sure that all of the district leaders had information in an aggregated way about their schools so that was something that did happen now with that did you tell the schools who should be in their respondent groups or suggest any members that should be in their respondents groups? Yes, we um, well, we acknowledge that every school is very different. And I am sure all of you on the webinar today come from lots of different places. Um, but Alaska has a really big variety of school sizes. So, I mean, anything from like eight students to many hundreds of students, thousands of students. So there was a lot of variation. And, and with that variation in school size comes a lot of variation in staffing structures. So, you know, in an ideal world, we thought a school leader, a school counselor, perhaps some teachers, um, perhaps some support staff that work in different capacities. But we knew that that just wasn't gonna be realistic at every school. Um, not every school has a school counselor. Um, sometimes the principal is also the teacher. Uh, like it just really differed. So. We wanted to empower schools to kind of make the choice that made sense in their context, but we also gave in our survey um, instructions a list of roles that we thought would be uh, relevant if they if they had them. So a follow up to that, did you did the survey record what roles participated? Yes, it did. And we are uh, as part of kind of our next steps right now is we are working with Deed to do a research study. Uh, with that survey data. So we are just now starting to like clean the data and really get into it. So um, we don't have findings to share quite yet, uh, but that is something to look forward to in the future that we're going to be looking at, at what implementation looks like in the state and then looking at some of the school characteristics and outcomes that might be associated with implementing a trauma-engaged approach. So uh, coming back to the survey collection, were there patterns to the 40% of schools that did not end up responding? That is a very interesting question and something we're actually diving into with the research study right now. Um, so I don't have a great answer quite yet, but that's something we're definitely going to be looking at. Uh, how many full-time staff worked on outreach? So at DEED, I would say there were primarily two staff, Sharon being one of them, uh, that presented. Um, there were two staff that I think did a lot of the legwork on this, um, as well as some other members of their team that maybe contributed in a smaller or kind of more limited capacity. And then outside of DEED, there were um, folks in multiple organizations that were spending some time on this. It may not have been, you know, exorbitant amounts of time, but they participated in the working group to develop the survey. They contributed to the plan and they helped with some of the kind of messaging and outreach. Um, REL Northwest also was there along the way to kind of be a supportive friend and to kind of fill in gaps where we could if there were things that were just really challenging or um, guidance was needed. So, for example, we made a lot of guidance documents to kind of make it super easy to know what steps needed to happen to check response rates and to create a template where they could put in the numbers and things automatically generated. Um, so there was kind of some things that we did in our REL Northwest capacity to make it easier along the way. But um, it wasn't a ton of staff. Uh, we know that about 60% of schools participated, but did all districts in the state participate or is there a percentage of districts that participated? Don't have the person. Uh, so every district had at least one response, but I wish I had the range for you in terms of what percentage of districts or of schools within districts, but I don't have that in front of me. Uh, did any districts or schools have the opportunity to provide feedback on the questionnaire? Yes. So we piloted the survey tool with three, with uh, folks from three different districts, and we asked them to take it like they would in real life. 
Um, and so they gave us feedback both on kind of questions that are like, this doesn't really make sense, or the answer options are weird with this, um, as well as quite, uh, some feedback around like just how long it took, what level of investment. Because we wanted to be realistic with people. We didn't want people to sit down thinking this was a 20 minute survey and then be surprised. We wanted this, to, like we wanted our messaging to reflect reality. Um, and so their feedback was really, really helpful in fine tuning a bunch of our questions to make sure they made sense. All right. I think that might be ending our breakout room time. Thank you so much, Thanks. Ashley. Watching everybody return from your breakout rooms and conversations. The final few seconds as everybody closes and gets back into our room together. Really kind of fun to watch the questions populating in the Google Docs from the main room as we made sure everyone was where they need to get to. We are entering into the final 10 minutes of our time together today. And um, as many people said, they wanted to be in all three groups at once. Uh, we will be sending out those recordings. But in the meantime, we'll kind of get the opportunity to hear a very final thought from each of the groups. So we're going to start out with group one. And uh, Danette, I would love if you could come off mute and give us a highlight from your group. Sure. We have a lot of energy in our group around implementation. We're just so eager to know what's happening at the school and district level. Um, and Sharon uh, was able to share some specific examples and also foreshadow. That's a big part of what we're doing here in this partnership is to just get a sense of what's happening around the state in terms of actual trauma-engaged practice at the local level and use of these resources and tools. We also talked about kind of the timing of the pandemic and kind of implications and opportunities to both have greater uptake of the resources, unfortunately a greater need for them, um, and uh, ways that um, Sharon and her team and collaborators might think about um, incorporating lessons learned from that specific event um, that we all shared um, into the work moving forward. So I think I'll leave it at that, but there was a nice rich discussion. Thank you, Danette. And Chris, can you give us a report out from the survey development? Yeah, group? very happy to. We had, we had a great, uh, we had a really good discussion and opened it up for uh, questions and, and that, that led to a nice uh, overall uh, interactive conversation. Uh, uh, people were very interested in the design of the uh, survey, what how the content um, was developed. So that's the collaborative approach of it. Uh, people were very interested in the incentives and how that worked and and uh, and you know the impact the incentives had uh, on the on the survey response rates, uh, things like that. But uh, we had a very interesting conversation just on the variety of topics and um, again told folks I'll drop it in the chat but if you have any follow-up questions uh, following this webinar you can certainly uh, reach out to us at uh, the email just posted in there relnw at wested.org. Thank you Chris and last but not least Crystal if you could give us the report from the survey administration group. Sure. Um, we really dove into the nuts and bolts of how this was administered. There were a lot of questions around the incentives and how those were decided, how those were funded, and what kinds of impact um, those had on the surveys. We also had several questions about how do you manage a survey that's maybe in a larger state or maybe something that's not statewide, and actually described different ways that you could leverage uh, district personnel, and then also um, reaching out and leveraging the school administrators and school counselors that you know. And so um, finally, there were some great questions about, you know, what's next, and Ashley described some of the things that they would be delving into um, next. Great. Thank you all. And I encourage everybody in your session links document, you have a ton of resources um, from the 
website with the trauma-engaged framework to the resource that this team put together, as well as all the different questions that came up in those breakout rooms. So uh, Diana just dropped that in chat again. Make sure you keep this window open um, and take a little time to explore from that from, from those uh, links there. And um, last but not least, your feedback is super important to us. And we are going to put into chat, there's that session feedback survey. It's not a one hour collaborative survey. Um, it is a three to four question one that will take you. Um, maybe a few minutes of the remaining time here to um, complete. So we encourage you to grab that link and uh, fill out that survey. Really appreciate your feedback. Um, and we will stick around for a little, any last minute quest burning questions that you did not get answered. Um, but again, thank you so much for joining us and for having these conversations here. Um, please grab that link and use these last few minutes to uh, complete that survey. And we are here for any questions. Uh, feel free to kind of come off mute if you want to join the real informal part here. So thank you so much. And thanks for all the messages. And I resolve all again, I, I, I put the link in there earlier, but one thing is not in the session link that we'll be sure to send out is that uh, Rail Northwest blog that covered all of this topic that we, re we released the blog last month. So uh, we really uh, encourage you to uh, read that uh, blog and, and download the handout and digest this information. And certainly if you have any follow-up questions, we put that email in there, relnw at westhead.org, and we'd be happy to uh, answer any questions that have remaining. Appreciate your time today.